Welcome to Yugabyte DB, a distributed Postgres SQL database. Today we're going to explain how Yugabyte DB works as a cloud native distributed PostgreSQL database and demonstrate with code examples how important PostgreSQL concepts such as serializable transaction and partial indexes are preserved. My name is Lindsay Hooper and I'm one of the conference organizers and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I'm here with Bryn Llewellyn, a developer advocate at Yugabyte who specializes in SQL and stored procedures in the context of distributed SQL. Bryn has worked in the software field for more than 40 years and joined Yugabyte in 2019. Bryn started off doing image analysis and pattern recognition at Oxford University, programming in Fortran, and then worked in Oslo, first at the Norwegian Computing Center and then in a startup. In Norway, Bryn programmed in Simula, recognized as the first object-oriented programming language that was the inspiration for C++. And he came to Yugabyte from Oracle. So I want to welcome you, Bryn. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Bryn uh, to take it away. Enjoy. So we're off. Um, who am I and who do I think you are? Let's get this out of the way quickly. About me, well, you heard more than you ever want to hear, I think, already from Lindsay, but I can approach it a different way. Um, when we join Yugabyte, we're encouraged to write a little piece about why we did it. And I did one, and it's easy to find on our blog site. There it is. That's enough about me then. I'll tell you in a moment, though it's obvious where to find this blog site. What about you? That's far more, more important in a sense. I'm assuming that you know Postgres very, very well, that you actually wield it in your day job for a fair proportion of whatever you do in your day job. And indeed, not a week goes by without you typing SQL or indeed um, various create commands for um, stored procedures at the PSQL prompt. And I guess I'm going to allow myself to hope that you actually do know this world of stored procedures too. PLPGSQL, I have to struggle to pronounce that, but there you have it, I got it right then, and that you actually do use stored procedures. Um, and most critically, I'm just going to assume that I don't um, have to tell you about the reasons to use SQL and what's so good about it. I'm just going to take that for granted. And also that you're unashamedly um, happy with the idea that the notions that underpin SQL are not brand new. They're not new and gimmicky and they date from as long ago as the 1960s. So with that said, now then moving on, um, I'm gonna do a bit of stage setting here by um, doing a potted history of the two things that we claim are special about distributed SQL as a generic notion, and that's intrinsic scalability and intrinsic fault tolerance. So with respect to the first one, scalability, um, in my lifetime as a programmer at least, there was a long epoch of what we now call monolithic SQL databases. There didn't used to be a need, need for that name um, with no um, implied <laughs> negative criticisms here. PostgreSQL in its standard vanilla form is an example of a monolithic SQL database as is most of the others that you would have heard of that were born back then, Oracle Database, SQL Server, and so on. And um, when they were popular in their first few years of popularity, they were notable because they were the survivors of the pre-SQL era where all sorts of other things, network databases, hierarchical databases had their day, but COD and DATE and their thinking one over and then there we had it. And the thing that characterizes a monolithic database was um, exactly that. Um, all the data was stored and managed by one single computer, typically in one room, um, in some offices premises. Um, now, that was okay for an epoch, but as demands for throughput and storage volume increased, people found that they people, particularly in certain spaces of application um, use, found they couldn't accommodate everything in a, one of those single computers, no matter how much um, iron they threw at it, with the fastest possible CPUs and so on that they could get. And that led to um, some kind of decline in purity that lasted a fair time. 
where the first manifestation of it was sharding, in other words, slicing up data that would not ideally have been in a single database into um, no end of separate databases on separate machines over which the application code through some kind of net and in its own uh, world managed where appropriate to make the whole edifice look a bit like one single database. Um, clearly that brought all sorts of problems, not least the complexity of application development, but there were other problems too, as I'm sure you've heard of. And then came the era of NoSQL, which was basically um, a low level solution to um, managing tons and tons of data and having lots and lots of computers at your disposal to share the load. Um, but they had to sacrifice something and they sacrificed SQL. In other words, in with shared nothing, as it's usually called, and out with SQL. And that had its distinct advantages that these people who needed uh, arbitrarily large scale could get it and distinct disadvantages that I don't have to point out that application development and indeed correctness and all those things we know and love in the world of SQL went out the window. And then, you know, fast forward, Google develops a solution that aims to meet both goals. They have a kind of low level storage scheme, which is very much in the spirit of all the stuff I was just talking about. Lots and lots of computers shared nothing and stuff to keep it all in step. Um, but, uh, and indeed, a handwritten and somewhat primitive, but nevertheless SQL um, API layer. And the whole thing was for internal use. By that, I mean use by their engineers to back up famous things you'll have heard of, like, for example, AdWords and Google Play. Um, then the next milestone was good old Google deciding to, uh, on the one hand, offer this database spanner as a platform as a service offering uh, exactly and only uh, on, in their own cloud. And they also very kindly published the algorithms that led to a wave of startups and development um, to, to make kind of handcrafted or new versions of their basic concept. And that brought in then the era of open source distributed SQL databases. And that's us at Yugabyte. We're in that class not unique, but it's a fairly small class. And of course, at all stages during that history, no end of hybrids were born and they live on. For example, Oracle Database has Scheme, which is a, you know, adoption into the some kind of loosely speaking database layer of a sharding scheme where you still have many separate databases, but they do appear to be one and it's all managed slightly behind the scenes, but in no way at all like the way, the kind of bottom-up way that it's done in genuine distributed SQL and so on. So that was that part, the uh, pursuit of performance, now about the pursuit of fault tolerance or sometimes known as high availability. In other words, all these gazillion nines that we hear about all the time, um, availability must not be inter interrupted is the goal. Um, so um, at one stage, the goal was never articulated. Here's the history. Companies each had their own computers on their own premises. They shut down at the weekend. Everyone went home and had proper lives. And uh, someone over the weekend did a full backup. That's all there was. And they drove the tapes off to somewhere else to store them. And then, of course, as time went on, shutdowns were allowed to happen less and less frequently. And the era of incremental backup entered. Uh, it all meant, so to speak, a good safety net. But if something went wrong, well, you had no um, alternative but to take a notice or outage, uh, recruit new kit, uh, restore everything from backup, and then come up again. And the outages on occasions caused by whatever fault was as dramatic as that could last, you know, not only hours, but even some days, according to the volumes of data involved. And then um, as databases started to back internet facing applications, that even that was considered, well, not even, that's the wrong word, that obviously was considered inadequate. And that was the um, heralding of this era of a primary and standby model. And that's very common today as well as what I might dare to call the old fashioned solution, 
to which um, <laughs> distributed SQL has a modern solution. And the basic concept, you know it inside out, is to have a complete replica of your actual database, your operational database in use, which is held uh, as close as is practical in synchronizing, synchrony with it, but with a certain, um, certain lag, of course. Um, it's based on um, mining and replaying the um, post-committed information, um, what in some worlds is called change data capture, and in some worlds um, it's called redo log mining and redo apply and so on. You know the game. Um, well, um, that's when NoSQL came in, and with its shared nothing, bringing just at the one basic level um, scalability, they also decided to take on the, um, in their designs, in the concepts as they were born, uh, the notion of intrinsic low level automatic replication, giving um, therefore fault tolerance in an entirely different way. So that meant that instead of replicating at the granularity of the whole database, the unit of repli replication was a part of a shard using the word slightly different from how it's sometimes used of a single table um, spread among several machines and kept in step by some low level magic under the covers. Um, and uh, that in a way meant even more outward SQL, outward SQL deluxe. And then eventually, thanks to Google and their pioneering work, we had where we are now, distributed SQL. In other words, you have your cake and eat it. And in the general world, distributed SQL means some um, query or SQL processing layer, um, in Google's case, handwritten, in the case of other things you'll have heard of in this space, possibly CockroachDB, TyDB, handwritten, but uniquely, uh, as it concerns today's talk especially, uh, UbyteDB uses the Postgres code as is, and it bases it on a storage scheme which is inspired by this whole Google business. And uh, it brings, I would say, the best of both worlds. So there we have the history, and now um, moving on. So uh, let's just look at what it means then to have the Postgres SQL processing code, not just something that's written to emulate it, but that actual open source code taken and um, bottom half thrown away and refitted onto our storage. What does that mean? Well, this down the bottom is some marketing stuff we have where they list up various fe SQL features, but there's no point in doing that for you guys who know Postgres SQL. I can rather say that um, our system, to anyone who sits at the PSQL prompt, and in our case, what we call YSQL SH, um, it's, it's basically the same thing with a different name, um, you can't see the difference between the two. And though Stacy promised, because I rashly promised once to do demos, I really think that's a bit of a waste of time. That's what I mean by meta, meta, meta. So I'm not going to do any demos, but I might flash one past you. Uh, I'm not going to even be very careful to tell you how to reach it. I'm just going to tell you the general way that you can find your way to demonstrations that then you can then do for yourself. And then when you do that, you'll really believe the truth of what I'm saying. So I'll flash over here as quickly as I can now. Um, wait a minute, what is going on here now? Um, here, I hope you can see this and I hope that someone will type to Stacy if you can't, but on the left is an ordinary web browser and on the right is um, actually, because it's blue and not yellow, it's Postgres SQL. And if I just um, do this here, shortcut for a bit of SQL. It tells me that I'm you know, in such a database, I'm such a user. This is the Postgres version. I've chosen that, though I know it's not the recent one, the most recent one, because Yugabyte DB is based on that distribution, will upgrade presently. And obviously then in this case, there is no Yugabyte DB. It's not that, it's the vanilla thing. It's on my MacBook. And here on this other screen, I've got the same thing. Let me just throw away that user and create him again from scratch so I don't get confused, clear the screen and see who the hell I am now. I'm the same 
um, user in the same database with the same default schema, same version of Postgres, but now the bottom half is this almost current version of Yugabyte DB. And all I have to do now is, in the spirit of metaness, is go into our docs, find something of interest, like the array data type functionality. I know my way around this because I've just finished writing it over the course of the last couple of, or more than a couple of weeks. If I go into one particular thing, this for each loop, I'm sure you all know about that. Um, they're just copy and paste ready examples in here. I'm just going to pick anything that takes my fancy. Something here, um, I'm creating a type, I'm just doing an anonymous block. I'll just copy it and I will stick it into this and there you are, it goes through and it produces those results. And it's showing incidentally, if you care, that the functionality of this for each loop in one of its uses is the same as the functionality of this unnest thing. Okay, um, not very complicated, but you recognize these bits of special syntax that uh, unique as far as I recall now to Postgres, but they're certainly not the same in Oracle. Um, and then I'm just going to go over to the white screen and um, I've got myself a clean slate so there's no objects I could collide with and paste in the same thing. I think I can stop at that point. There's tons, well, no, I'll do one more, but then I'll move on. Just, I'm gonna find a long source text of a procedure. Um, and by the way, look, well, I'll post it. This is not the long one. Just notice I've got, you know, any element and any array. That's a nice Postgres feature that, believe it or not, Oracle database doesn't have. And there it is working ordinarily in Yugabyte DB. If you were to do the same thing in um, Postgres, you couldn't see the difference. And only because it's so long and therefore so wonderful and complicated, um, I'm just going to spray that one in and it certainly works, okay? Um, no, um, no problems there. That was one way that you can demonstrate for yourself that the two are the same. And um, I could say it now, I may as well get it out of the way. Um, if you go to our site, you will even hear, you know, you'll be confronted with things that invite you to download and install. And um, you must have downloaded and installed Postgres many times. It's quick and easy, isn't it? And it's the same kind of thing with Yugabyte DB. You can install the current version and be running SQL at the prompt if, if you've done it once or twice before, especially in just minutes. If you're doing it the first time and you want to check everything that happens, you'll maybe um, take a little bit more time. But it's minutes, not hours. And it um, is just a simple, painless process. Now about that other stuff, um, well, um, all you have to do is look up um, on our blog site. Um, the URL actually says blog.yugabyte.com author Bryn. And here's about oh, eight or so posts I've done. You can find something on, um, what was it that Stacy mentioned? Partial indexes in there and you table functions, all sorts of things. If you go into one of them, you'll find the same idea. There are these, oh look, and someone's inviting you to find out more about our stuff. I'll get him out of the way. And you know, it's the same as the docs. In other words, take any one of these things, run it in Postgres, run it in um, what we call YSQL SHA, in other words, against the Yugabyte DB on your own MacBook, you can't see the difference. So that's enough of the meta, meta, meta demos. And now back to the talk. Um, there we are, just in case you have difficulty remembering, this is obvious, author, Brilliant. That's enough to find my posts. Okay, now then, um, a bit more on the background reading and then we'll start. If you want to know about the high level what and why of all this lot, like what is distributed SQL, someone else's take on the story that I gave in a way, a distinction between SQL and new SQL, uh, why we did all this stuff that I've talked about and we'll talk about more, Postgres on top of this here spanner inspired thing and um, more detail on that. These are very general, you know, five minute reads. These are, you know, maybe 10, 15, minute, 20 minute reads. And then there's this here stuff that I just mentioned that you can use to convince yourself that if it works in Postgres, it'll work in Yugabyte DB. Okay, so enough of that. Oh no, I pressed the wrong button yet again. Forgive my fumbling. And now we'll move on 
to the real thing. Just one last bit of waffle. Um, what is EgobyteDB and why you might be interested? Well, um, to take the second thing first, I hope you'd be interested because on the one hand, it'll look just the same as what you know and love. So the learning experience will be tiny when you come to sit at a prompt and type up SQL and create persistent objects and so on. Um, on the other hand, you might be interested exactly because it's a database for the modern world embodying this whole stuff about distributed SQL that I've already explained. Um, so these are the, I'm not supposed to do a marketing talk, these are just in a sense properties of all of these um, distributed SQL databases, except in the sense that Google Spanner doesn't aim to be open source and doesn't aim to be run anywhere, it's its own proprietary thing. But with respect to the other two that I mentioned, CockroachDB, TidyDB, I'm sure they'd all claim the same things. This intrinsic fault tolerance, the bottom up thing, based on a low level of granularity of replication, which I'm going to explain in some sketched detail, that's part of the proposition. And that is also the, you know, this low level um, replication sharding, as it's sometimes called, is what leads to the arbitrary scalability. Um, it's based on intrinsic auto sharding. You can add nodes on demand. I have low latency queries. And when you measure throughput, considering that you're distributing the demand for throughput across a ton of independent computers, you can see it can go up arbitrarily high and people have measured, you know, IOPS in the millions and um, managing terabytes per node of data on uh, lots of nodes, which multiplies up the total storage. And leaving Google out of the picture now, no vendor, no cloud vendor lock-in, I should say. Uh, all these three guys, including us, have designed from the get-go to be able to run on premises, on rented virtual machines, or in some kind of containerized scheme, which these days is bound to be Kubernetes. Um, it runs in such systems because it was designed to, and as far as ours at least is concerned, but I know more than the others, it's um, ready for you to do that kind of deployment painlessly because all we have in our GitHub repo, all these um, Helm charts that you hear so much about that mechanize the setup for you. And all these things le lead to this famous notion of being a distributed SQL database and uniquely for us, whoop, I didn't do that very well, fully Postgres compatible. Okay then, so now for something completely different in the remaining 20, 25 minutes, which is as much real substantive detail as I can squeeze in the substance. But it will, let me be unashamed about this, be some kind of sketch, um, but let's hope it tempts you to uh, read more in our docs and in our blogs, at least in our blogs. So here we go. Um, the design goals, it's worth restating these before I really, really, really get started. We wanted to be, before we'd done it, Postgres SQL compatible, not in that kind of emergent sense by having programmed it all so that it would end up like that, but exactly by virtue of this, reusing the Postgres code as it is. And um, we have demonstrated that we can adopt a newer version of Postgres when we feel it's the appropriate time to do so um, by a relatively small amount of work. And um, we have proved by doing that, that new changes in the Postgres scheme don't break any of the existing things, either as the end user sees that, which I mean by that the developer user sees it, which you know inside out already, or with respect to how it sits on our storage layer. Um, and that I bled into this second point here. And uh, this is, of course, a statement from kind of marketing guy. Um, when they say things happened in a very, very short time, they may be glossing over things like how much time it took to test it when it was nominally working very well. But that aside, you know, a movement from one major release of Postgres to another one in weeks, not months, and certainly not years, is the takeaway from this. And we'll do the same again when we believe that it's the right moment for 
um, Postgres 12 something. Um, and then this point, again, just to reiterate it, um, you get this um, ability to run anywhere by um, stating it as a goal before you've done anything and testing for it all the time by deploying your things on all the possible clouds in all the possible ways. And sure enough, we've achieved that. Okay then. So then, the functional architecture is now shown in this picture, but I've said it more times than I can recall now in the space of this talk, that we have this upper half consisting of exactly the Postgres code, a certain part of it, the part that's responsible for SQL processing. And then at the bottom, we have something that we call DocDB. If you've heard the word RocksDB, it's based on that, but it isn't that any longer. And um, the theory behind it is inspired by Spanner, but we are not using anything that actually is Google Spanner code. It's the thoughts that we're using. And that uh, gives what I've just been talking about on the previous slide. So then, um, now I have to introduce some vocabulary and it'll be a bit of a rush, but I hope it gives you a sense of what all this is about. So we use the word table in two domains of discourse. We use it as you use it daily, as a phenomenon that you get when you go create table, alter table, and a phenomenon that you use to advantage when you do insert, delete, <laughs> update and select. Uh, but that kind of thinking of the word table is just mapped one-to-one -to, -one to some phenomenon in our .db world. And without any detail now, the scheme down there is a kind of key value pair at the lowest level of granularity where a key is everything that encodes the uniqueness of a field in a SQL table. You know, what table is it in? What column in that table is it in? Who's the uh, owner and database of that table? And um, so on. Um, that's the key and the value is of course just the value with some um, representation by its side of what the data type is because down at the lowest level it's just bits and bytes. Um, and then the model that operates down at that lowest of all levels is a kind of um, write only and write the latest model with a timestamp. And that you can imagine brings an intrinsic way to do this multi-version concurrency control. Um, you just read not necessarily the latest version of a particular key value pair when you're reading all the key value pairs that you need to constitute the results of a SQL statement, but rather you read the ones that correspond to some um, transaction ID that is the one that you uh, have selected by when you did it for your query. Okay, so enough of all that lot. That's what this one means. Um, now, there's this notion of tablets then, which is our word for sharding. So in your SQL world, you could think, how many tablets have I got in my table? How is it cut up conceptually? And then at the lower level, you would discover that these um, slices that we call tablets are mapped to things that are physical down in the DocDB world. But you come to understand that there's no actual manifestation, visible, measurable, manifestation of this um, tabletizing, sharding in the SQL world, no queries you can do use usefully that you would ordinarily do to find out that you don't need to care. In other words, when you think about development, application development, you don't think about tablets. You only think about them if you're a kind of deployment engineer wondering how many to have, where to put them, uh, how many you need to give this kind of performance, um, you know, metric that you've decided you wanted. So then, um, this is the next point then. Um, a tablet, as this conceptual idea, is actually a set of tablet peers, replicas, and they are kept in replicated synchronization with each other by a scheme that I'll sketch a little, bit, a little about presently. But um, the basic concept is that this synchronization is transactional, not as it is between a, an HA primary and an HA standby, uh, not at all that, but rather properly transactional in, 
every meaning of that word, where you use such words in the same sentence as the word acid. Um, so then these tablet peers, in other words, the set of some number of slices, each of which is identical to its peer, other peers, and each of which corresponds to some shard of data in a particular table, they are managed down at the low level, and each of them, for some particular table, ends up on its own storage managed by its own node. Um, and we use this word RF, and I've got it there and I've got it here. It stands for replication factor, and the minimum useful value for the replication factor that you can choose is three. Um, because you want fault tolerance and you want fault tolerance with a safety net. If you've got three, then one can go away. Here we are. You can survive with no safety net or limited safety net on two. When you've got three working normally, then you're protected fully. When you go down to two in some crisis situation, then you are still um, protected but you don't want to remain so thinly protected, you're going to work behind the scenes to put a new node back into your system, or maybe to notice that some network problem, which was the cause of the apparent outage, has gone away, the way these things come and go in the wonderful world of cloud. You can even go down to one, but if you do go down to one, then you can no longer take writes, because if you did, you'd have no safety net, but you can by all means read, from those, but that's pushing the envelope of, um, <laughs> you know, risking it. Um, now, bigger values than three are uh, certainly feasible, five, seven, and so on. For various reasons, it should be a, must be an odd number, and they bring more fault tolerance. But I, I'll always assume when I'm talking for the rest of this short presentation that, that three is our number. So that's that. Um, each table is sharded into some number of tablets, and when I say about 10, I mean 10, not two, and not 100, but um, not exactly 10. Um, and then these tablets of a particular table are sprayed around the place. Um, moving on, um, each tablet peer then for a given table is on a different node, and one of these, by a process of dynamic election among the softwares running on the set of nodes that jointly have this set of tablet peers is the nominal leader and the leader has some real significance basically reads and writes can only go through the leader and the other guys called followers are there exactly for the purposes of this intrinsic automatic fault tolerance now um, as i said each table has its peers spread among nodes. And if the um, replication factor is three, then any tablet from any table will be on some set of three nodes. And don't forget, you can have many, many more nodes than three if three is our replication factor. And the node count can be anything you want, four, 17, or 18, or 16, or 12, you know? Um, now, if a node vanishes for some reason, well, all the tablet peers that were lead that were being led there are then led somewhere else now at this point i have to stress that while for a, from the perspective of a given table when the replication factor is three its tablet peers will be on three different nodes if you now focus on a particular node it'll have tablet peers from no end of tables um, where the other peers of that table are not on the same nodes as the peers of some other tablet that are on that node. Now that might sound too much many to one year and too much complexity, but the upshot of all that lot is uh, distribution and no single point of failure and all those other benefits. Right then. Um, so uh, the last point, or I hope it's the last point here, is that you can add a node to the cluster. I'm in the administrator now. And by the way, I didn't use the word until now, but a cluster is the word we use um, when we're talking about the set of nodes that jointly accommodate all the storage and computing power that give your end SQL experience the properties of distributed SQL that I mentioned, but nevertheless, the absolute guarantee that it feels like Postgres with 
everything that that implies, not least the um, notions of acid. But that's what a cluster is, and you can add a node to the cluster, or indeed decommission one at any time. Obviously, you're not going to decommission one when you've only got three, but if you put extra ones there for the purpose of some, of some planned peak load, the famous Black Friday we keep on hearing about, and if you've got through that, then you can decommission them. You can do that at any time. Um, and this is, of course, the clue to demand-based scalability. And when you do add in a new node, then it automatically takes over, oh, I spelled that wrong, sorry, tablet peers from other nodes over a period of certainly minutes, not seconds, to um, balance things out so that you have uh, equal throughput being sustained from all of the different nodes. So then, now, um, especially now, if not, you felt it before, this is going to be um, giving you a sense of what's going on so that you can appreciate, if you like, the physics, the reality of it all, um, to make it all seem a bit more plausible. So this now is um, a contrast between the high level granular picture of the Postgres architecture here on the left and the corresponding picture of Yugabyte DB here on the right. And the critical noticeable thing is here, you have one occurrence of the upper half stuff. Um, and it's all communicating with a single system for storage. Maybe I'm being a little bit um, sketchy when I say that because you all know more than me that um, every um, client it has its own back end, and this really is the uh, its own background process, or whatever you want to call it. And this is really what this green thing is. But they're all communicating with a single um, storage system, and they're all on one computer. Now here we are in Yugabyte DB, where these things here, this bit here, this bit here, these three columns with green on the top and blue on the bottom, are different nodes. And each of them has its own instantiation of the .db code and its own instantiation of the um, upper half of the Postgres code. That's the principal difference then in the architectural approach. So that um, whatever happens when clients compile SQL and the SQL gets cached in the background process um, is now happening separately, independently on each of the separate nodes. But you can imagine whatever you have to do for cache invalidation and the rest of it, we have it going on. Um, so let's just now sketch what happens when you create an end user table and you do some inserts. Um, so as I've said, tables map to the same phenomenon down at the bottom level and there's this tabletization. Now system tables or what you might call catalog tables they are in one sense tables like any other tables, but we decided to hand them, handle them specially by um, putting them in special .db tables. Um, and all these use just a single table, so a single tablet with its peers. So the whole of the catalog is concentrated and managed um, by a slightly different, but basically similar process to the one that manages the ordinary peers from end user tables. And the reason for this difference in approach is because um, there's almost nothing you can do that doesn't need to consult the um, catalog. And we wanted to do some special optimizations there. And um, without any further detail, that's it. That's how it came out. So then this bit I already sketched. Um, all the, at the lowest, lowest, lowest of levels, it's just key value pairs where the semantics are sort of brought in as you go up through the stack. Um, and as I've mentioned, this is a recap, we have to bear in mind these notions of the replication factor being an odd number, typically three, and um, that will be, by the way, a fixed property of the cluster from when you created it. And then the number of nodes, which can be anything you want, as long as it's not fewer than the replication factor, and you can increase or decrease that on demand. And then there's the number of tablets per table, as I said, which is 
um, you know, in flux exactly how it's pinned down. I just mean by that more and more flexibility is coming with successive Yugabyte DB releases, but roughly speaking, as mentioned, um, it's on the order of 10-ish, not two-ish and not 100-ish. So then here we go. The first thing you do when you create a table is obviously the create table statement, whose initial um, effect is um, to establish metadata in the catalog, saying what this table is about, you know, what it's called, what its columns are, uh, what the data types are, or what constraints there are, all that stuff. Um, but not only that, some kind of storage stuff has got to be set up for it. Now, in the interests of not making these diagrams ridiculously complicated, there are only three nodes drawn, the column on the left, the column in the middle, the column on the right, each showing its upper half and its bottom half and we're stressing the word stateless about Postgres, meaning not that there's no in-memory state, but meaning that it doesn't do anything itself involving persistent data on disk. Rather, all the persistence is done by this guy communicating to one of these guys as appropriate and that guy communicating to other guys. Now, there are only three nodes on the picture because otherwise it would get mad, but these little ellipses are meant to indicate that you can have many many more than three but as far as the catalog is concerned it will be distributed among some particular three when the replication factor is three now time is running really short now so i'm going to rush this bit um so somehow or other the create table statement finds its way down to the dot db node which is the leader for the tablet peer set that implement the catalog and then in comes the request and it gets to the right place by suitable redirecting along the way and then something is done there but before the response is given these guys go out sideways and keep their peers in step and eventually when all that is complete um, the next step goes through which is to create the storage for the peers in the newly created table and here we're squeezing it all into one diagram but let's say that the newly table newly created table has lots of tablet peers and here is the master for the peer t3 here's the master for the peer t2 i hope you can see where i'm pointing here's the leader I hope I meant to say leader, not master. Here's the leader for the peer T1. And these in a more general picture would be all on different nodes in a bigger picture. And there'd be many more than three of them as well. There'd be eight or 10 of them. So then that's roughly then at the first stage of the bootstrap. Um, now, moving on then, when we do some insert, um, let's just say, that because the thing down the bottom is a key value pair the primary key is a thing of significance it's a kind of index organized storage kind of scheme and you will be best off if you declare all your tables as you should anyway ordinarily with a properly defined primary key and then that will be the clue to link the notion in the sql world to the notion in the storage world and because um the storage is intrinsically indexed, organized, we've fallen into the habit of calling um, such things that are indexes on other columns secondary index because the rows in the table are primarily intrinsically indexed by the index organized structure. But if you want indexes on other columns for ordinary reasons, then we call them secondary indexes. And by the time you get down to the lowest level of, of storage, they are just other .db tables. So you can imagine that when an insert is done into a table upon which there exists a secondary index, there's some kind of recursive uh, action to update the index to in the normal way. And that is going to impact yet more nodes than if there weren't such a secondary index or set of them. So this now, absolutely as a sketch is what happens at this stage um, we come in with our insert some guy is going to coordinate it all it goes there it's spread out there and if there were indexes it would be spread out to wherever the indexes are as well and then that brings us to this story of 
um, distributed um, transactions. A distributed tra transaction is the word you know and love from you know, database links and that kind of thing, and two-phase commit, all those ideas. Um, everything has to happen, to first order, to completion before the acknowledgement is given back that you really got completion. But having said that, um, with our tolerant system, we um, can accommodate hearing only from a majority of the um, nodes who manage the peers in question. So if the um, replication factor is three, the master certainly gets it first and is the master, the leader, I should say, not master, of the whole um, whole acknowledgement process, but he has to hear back not from each of the other two in his set of three, but from only one of them, because that's the majority. Um, right then. Now, all I'm going to do now is step through this and show you all these arrows flying around the place. Um, no more than that, to get you the general idea that there's no free lunch. So if you want this intrinsic fault tolerance, and if your fault tolerance is brought by having these um, replicas on different nodes, where in the limit these different nodes are not different only within a data center, but they're different across data centers within one region, and in the limit they're even spread across the globe, then there's going to be some speed of light effect coming in and anything that you do is going to be in some way slower obviously by the laws of physics than it would be in a monolithic system like in our case the direct comparison with postgres you could do any test compare some kind of response time thing in postgres vanilla and in yugabyte and of course postgres would be faster but if you measured throughput and cranked it up way, be especially way beyond what a monolithic Postgres could sustain, well then, that's where the things would kick in. And long story short, having got through all that lot um, and skipping this lot, um, and I'm about to do the summary, we can say that um, in the bigger picture of everything that goes on in the application tier and in the context that this is a typical OLTP type of thing, that doesn't involve masses of data going in and out on any particular SQL statement, it all works out so that the net penalty of the uh, performance effects from the speed of light effect that I showed are well worth paying to get the benefit of the um, arbitrary no limit on scalability and the intrinsic automatic self-healing fault tolerance. So here comes the summary. Um, I have slightly fewer minutes left before the magic my time 11 o'clock, but I think that's good enough. On the left, we have um, a little graphic here with the elephant by it that reminds you what's what you know already, what's so attractive about Postgres as a proposition. It's open source, and among these, it is generally thought to be the one with the most sophisticated functional SQL system. And then on the right, in the world of aspiration, we have back in the day, Google Spanner as the only example of a SQL top half on the distributed storage system that was so attractive for the reasons I've explained. However, the Google Spanner had, I'm gonna say it unashamedly, two distinct advantages. One was you could have it anywhere you wanted as long as you <laughs> rented it from Google and it was on their equipment. And the other was that, dare I say it, their SQL system is far from advanced because after all, they wrote it to initially meet their own requirements and they didn't write it to be general. Whereas Postgres was invented to be a proper fully functional general SQL system. So what you want is those two worlds, the advantages of them both, and here we see them uniting in, um, forgive me for this if it sounds marketingly, but uniting in uniquely here. Other ones in this space have that kind of system based on that kind of thinking for the storage, but they don't have the, you know, um, by construction compatibility with SQL from Postgres, rather they just have a best effort by programming it explicitly, um, attempt to emulate it. 
So there we are. Um, just to remind you again, um, if you're so inspired about further reading, there's the high level what and why, uh, more detail about the upper half and the lower half picture, and my posts about all sorts of things that you can do in SQL that you can do in both Postgres and um, our Yugabyte indistinguishably. And finally then, um, here's just a plug to download it and give it a try. And if you're so inspired to join our Slack channel, and if you're even more inspired to give us a star on Yugabyte DB. So thank you for your attention. I will blame the slight lateness of the end, only two minutes from the nominal end on um, various things outside of my control. But that aside, um, Stacy did say to me, and I'll repeat it now, um, though she didn't say it at the start, that I'll stay on for as long as um, people want to put and um, hear answers to questions. But um, you can, by all means, feel free to go now. So let me see what's, um, if I can find it, on the chat. And um, for those of you who do feel it's time to go, I'm just going to thank you for your attention and um, leave it at that. First question, what is a major advantage um, oppose Oracle database RAC? Oh, well, um, now that's a rather specific question. I guess um, I don't know if everyone on the out there knows what Oracle is usually pronounced rack is, but um, it's, a, it's its own thing. I would put it in that space of a hybrid solution where um, it's neither properly deserving of the word monolithic, but it's certainly not distributed. It's basically one single set of storage stuff where every datum is recorded just once. It's what Larry Ellison is famous for saying on stage all the time. He hates um, the shared nothing. He won't have anything to do with it. So it's a sh no share of anything, single set of storage, each datum once. And it has then, they used to say, lots of computers all communicating with it and with each other to manage it. But it seems to have settled down that um, that system is no longer thought of as useful for um, scalability, but useful only for fault tolerance. Now, I may be speaking out of turn when I say that, and product managers of Rack would you know, fight me on that point. But some people who are just neutral people in the outside world have come to think that. So that's basically, Rack is a solution to a problem, but it's not the solution to the problem that distributed SQL solves. Distributed SQL solves arbitrary scale simply by adding more and more and more ordinary commodity nodes when you need it. And it solves the problem of fault tolerance at this low level of within table granularity that I spoke of using this whole tablet scheme that I mentioned. And Oracle database, rack or single instance has none of that. So that's the best way I can contrast the two. Um, another thing I could say is that if your need for scalability has a definite, predictable, known for all time into the future maximum uh, ceiling, well, you're okay with such a monolithic scheme and you can get various benefits with the classic schemes, RAC to give you some kind of local um, fault tolerance of equipment and schemes, whatever the database you're using is, for giving you high availability by means of a primary standby failover system, or even if you want to get more advanced, you know, um, redo log or whatever you want to call it, change data capture based um, asynchronous um, multi-master replication, which of course brings a nightmare of application coding discipline, but can nevertheless be used to affect Maybe that was too long an answer to the question, but I hope it was adequate. Next question. No, you have a lot of people um, cheering you on in the comments here saying, great explanation. Oh, well, um, that's great. How about compatibility? I say, by the way, my Twitter handle is not known for my brevity, so you have been warned. <laughs> um, next question is, how about compatibility with extensions? Oh, well, um, I, the short answer is yes, 
I should always lead with that. There's obviously a story. Um, a lot of the Postgres extensions, or some of them, a notable number of them, have to do with things down at the storage level. So they have no um, value in our world because we do things differently. But something like um, the extension, I can never remember the names, but the one that brings you various kinds of random number generators, unique ID generators, and that kind of thing, that, that are entirely upper half uh, presence, well, we can manage them perfectly fine. Now, there is a little bit of a story there, as I'm sure you know better than me. When you uh, want to take one of those into use in Postgres, its code manifestation is there on the node, the one and only one node that you're using, and wiring it up is therefore straightforward. But what we have not done in the Yugabyte world is put the code for every single um, extension that there might be in some kind of management system so that whenever you dynamically add a node, as I explained, the extension code is magically present there too. That's, we haven't yet got that in our world, though we see a way of doing it. And I should have mentioned in saying that, which again you know, and that is some of the extensions might be entirely handcrafted by some um, shop who's deploying Postgres. And in that situation, then our scheme would have to be user extensible so that such a handcrafted extension could be put into our repository and automatically deployed to all the nodes as and when needed. Now, having said that, if you have a relatively stable park of nodes and you don't get disasters more often than it's just a minor trouble to attend to, then you can deploy the code for these extensions um, manually so that it all works out okay and your only cost is the thinking about it and the doing of it as and when you need to. Now, the extension I mentioned forgive me for not remembering its name, but I hope you know the one I mean, is um, managed rather more specifically in our world so that that one at least is just ordinarily available and all you have to do is to create extension DDL and bang, you have it. But other ones, you would have to plan your own scheme for making the code available on the nodes you happen to have. So I hope that was a sufficient answer. Yep, it absolutely was. What happens in Yugabyte when you add new nodes? Will it redistribute data between nodes or will it only, only add new tablets to the new nodes? Okay, so the first thing I have to do is of course acknowledge that that's a question that people are bound to uh, want to know the answer to. And in a respectable talk on this topic, I would have covered that preemptively and properly, but I just have to tell you that there's no way you can squeeze all that in for what I imagine to be the target audience in the course of any ordinary talk like this, you'd need perhaps a one day workshop on Yugabyte and all the things about it. So I kept on using the word sketch and I'll have to use it again a little bit, but I'll do my best. So um, I should first just mention something as a background nugget of fact to help your understanding. And that is all our um, data is stored actually in an intrinsically um, compressed form as well, so that the actual volume of stored data that you need to, to represent what needs to be um, represented is as small as it could be. And we have a scheme for shipping um, individual tablets, which is the level of granularity that needs to be shipped between nodes as and when it's needed, that's part of our whole kind of management system. So with that in mind, there's not so much to ship and it can be shipped as a lump. It doesn't need to be shipped in some SQL style. So if a brand new node is recruited into the system, then it is obviously starts off entirely unpopulated, but with the software installed on it. And this software is in a kind of heart beating communication with all the other um, instantiations of the same software on all the other nodes and all these ideas about leader and follower and so on um, are then part of its whole world and the community of them can recognize therefore that the new node has arrived and that it is presently unpopulated 
and arrange for particular peers that were in one place to be redistributed, I should just say recited, to the other place or behind the scenes. And um, the same sort of thing happens, but slightly in reverse, if a node vanishes, sorry about that, because um, when it vanishes, you've for a moment got only two peers instead of three, where you used to have three. So there's some scheme where uh, it's not just moving your peers, but replicating them, but all that is possible. Now that's one way of answering the question. An entirely different way is to say that on our website, um, I don't know if I can find it quick enough now, but since I'm on uh, a scheme now where the clock is not running, I'm going to risk this. Here I am on our property. And among other things, you can um, get started. And among the, all this, this shows you how you can download and load it and so on, that kind of stuff. But if you go a bit further in this world, um, you can get to the documentation and you can get to this thing called a quick start, um, which in the first case is just going to encourage you to install it and um, do all on your own computer, where for these purposes, you can have a single node uh, installation where of course you're not going to see any um, proof of concept of all the stuff I've been talking about. But the next thing you can do is, um, Let's see where this is, if I can find it quick enough. Um, somewhere here, explore core features. We're, we're, oh, sorry, I lost it for a second. Explore core features, linear scalability. Here, what you do is, um, by the way, we sometimes use this word universe, where I have been using the word cluster. There's a subtle and important distinction, but I'm not gonna go into it now. Um, what you do is create yourself on your own MacBook or whatever PC you use, a simulated three node uh, cluster, which you can do um, by, if you like, some kind of IP address loopback kind of scheme, but it will give you an adequate demo. And then when you get this far, you are going to yourself kill nodes and add them. And I won't go into it any further now, but we have various dashboards that show you the throughput being sustained by each node. And um, when you add a brand new one, of course, the throughput on it will be zero. And on the other ones, it'll be something where the something is roughly the same number on each of them. And then if you go and, well, let's say, stand up, stretch your legs, walk around, come back in five minutes, then you'll see that the throughput has balanced itself out exactly because the tablets who are the source of the throughput of course, have themselves been spread around so that there's now roughly an equal number of the tablets per node. I hope that answered the question at an adequate level of detail, but the meta answer is you can read lots more about it in our docs and you can do a demo without any fuss, without renting any cloud space or anything, just in a perfectly splendid simulation on your own personal computer where you can watch this happening. Uh, I hope that was adequate too. Next question. What is the main difference from Cockroach? Seems like Yugabyte has a more Cassandra-like pattern. Oh, well now, um, obviously now, as they say on every um, Twitter, uh, you know, <laughs> manifest at the top of oneself, what I'm now gonna say is my own opinions. Um, and I've heard other people say them, but I'm just gonna say them my way. Um, there were lots of things in that question, but at a sort of ordinary, non-technical way, Cockroach established itself in the world as a startup about a year before us. And so they have had all the time this um, lead uh, in general, um, let's say, awareness and all that kind of thing. Um, but at course level, we are very much aiming to be comparable solutions to the same problem. Now in the architectural sense, I think the most conspicuous difference is that um, we decided, and I think it's a brilliant decision, to adopt the Postgres code as is and to wire it up. And they decided rather to um, write their own simulation of the Postgres system 
in a best effort sense. And that means that in ours, you know, we get these exotic features. If you think partial indexes are exotic or not, that's a different discussion. But we don't have to think about that. They just sort of come more or less. We get all the array functionality just like that. We get all the JSON functionality just like that. And as I earlier said, I invited you to try it. So that's one difference. Um, and most notable in that, I would say, given my personal background, is that we naturally then have PLPGSQL stored procedures, as it happens, the cockroach developers didn't yet think it was a priority to implement that. So they have literally no stored procedure support. So there are those kind of functional differences. Now, um, another thing that follows in the train from that is that, this is perhaps getting a little bit technical now, you perhaps heard of, you must have heard of this basic theory that it's best to do whatever processing you do as close as possible to the data as you can. And as far as it um, concerns the whole way Postgres works, there are various things then that could be done entirely in the upper half, but could ideally be pushed down into the um, lower half and uh, therefore operate in tandem, each on their own node with some amount of synchronization and so on. Now we've done a fair bit in that space and we're constantly moving further along that road. And among the various blogs that you could find on our site, there's a whole account of this push down approach. Now I gave that as the technical background and I'm sure that Cockroach will want to and could do such a thing too, but it's particularly straightforward for us to do it exactly because our whole lower half system is written in C and where appropriate C++, which as you know, are just ordinarily interoperable. And the Postgres implementation, as you certainly know, is written in C. So this whole actual mechanics of doing the push down implementation is relatively straightforward, given that it's all rocket science for us and less so would it be for Cockroach. Um, exactly again because of, well, I didn't say it before, but they decided, given their background as Google engineers, that they were going to write their Postgres emulation, not in C at all, far too old fashioned, but in the language that you will all have heard lots about called Go. Um, you know, there are things like that. Um, but ultimately, I suppose, you might say, who cares about how it's done? They just, people only want to know how it all emerged. How do we compare in various forms of performance test and particularly the ones that are in some way industry standard? And the best answer I can give to that is again a meta answer. And that is that very recently uh, we've published some uh, blog posts exactly about this cockroach DB versus Yugabyte DB comparison. And you can guess how it happens in this space. It's rather funny in the world of open source, but it's on one hand, the liberation that all our source code is up there in a repo that people could just read. Um, we don't keep our plans secret, all that kind of stuff. And loosely, it's the same for Cockroach. And that means that when we compare, we can't bluff in any way. But nevertheless, there's a possibility for us on the one hand, doing an experiment with Cockroach to adopt some wrong practice. And equally for them, on the other hand, to adopt some practice when using our stuff or when they explain how our stuff works and say it's not as good as how their stuff works, it's quite possible for them to understand because nobody can read that much source code. So I would say then that um, they write something bad about us and we have a you know, naturally come back and write something where we attempt to bring some uh, science into the picture and exactly point out what they said that wasn't quite right. Well, you can read a good account of that stuff. And then um, I hope, as I am, you'll be convinced. So again, I hope metaness aside, that was an adequate answer to that question. Okay, then um, at the YSQL level, is there a notion of complied code or shared pool? Or does YSQL have to interpret the SQL and PG PLSQL every time it gets submitted? Um, the model that we have is the model that we inherit from um, Postgres. And in that sense, it's rather different, as I'm sure you all know out there, from what I at least was used to in Oracle. So um, 
Postgres has its own system doesn't persist compiled stored procedure code. It persists only the source code. And that means when it's first taken into use, it is compiled and then held in memory for use during the rest of the duration of that memory. But the other thing to say is that that memory is um, the local, if I can put it that way, the specific memory of uh, what I would loosely call the background process, the process who started up when you started your client and is who sus is sustaining your use of it. And that means that if some other brand new session in the ordinary PSQL, or in our case, YSQL shut sense starts up, they have their own dedicated background that is at the moment cold with respect to that kind of thing. Now that's how it works in Postgres, and that's currently how it works for us. Now we have the possibility, uh, because after all this is how open source works, of, of um, taking what we got and then improving on it in various ways, um, as long as we don't um, lose anything to do with the ultimate um, exposure of compatibility to the SQL programmer, but we haven't done that yet. So, and then as it was, if you like, in the ordinary single world, uh, sorry, single node world for Postgres users, so it is in the multi-node world for us too, in that, um, I suppose I should, in that um, every single node will have this going on, on each of the clients it's got supporting each of the connections in its connection pool. But um, I should say there, don't forget that in a modern overall application architecture, the background processes that you have sustaining the ultimate traffic are um, persistent, they don't come and go, and they soon get warmed up, however many of them you do have. And once they're there, they're warm and they stay there, and then any one of them is ready to take application traffic. And that means that all the normal benefits that you get from the Oracle SGA um, obtain here too. So again, as much as I could do uh, on the fly uh, without any slides or anything, but I hope that was adequate. So next question. Okay, and this is the last question we have. Um, what is the preferred upgrade path for Yugabyte? I.e., can you have the upgrade transition through nodes, or do I need to set up a replica of the database in sync, or do I need to do it completely in place and the database will not be available during the upgrade? I assume there that this is the upgrade from a particular version of Yugabyte, let's say version you know, 214, or 2.2, two, or whatever they might be called. I've suddenly forgotten our terminology, but you know what I mean, uh, to the next version of Yugabyte software. Um, now, under those circumstances, it's very much comparable with, I hope this is, doesn't confound the non-Oracle people out there, but very much comparable to a rolling rack upgrade, that um, when we bring out a new Yugabyte version, then the change is software only, and that means we can indeed take down individual nodes while all the others are still running and um, you know, put in place the new software in place of the old software, start it up again. And because naturally of a commitment, a tested commitment for uh, compatibility as you go up through the versions, everything will just continue to work. And knowing what you know about the ability to recruit new nodes when you um, want to, you could do that dance by adding a new node in as the first step, therefore being over provisioned for a bit, and then taking down the remainders one at a time until they're all upgraded and you know, letting them recover. And then when you've got through that exercise, um, then and only then, decommissioning the extra capacity, the luxury node that you had so that you wouldn't lose any overall throughput uh, or ability as this process was going on. So that's the short answer to it. There's an implied longer discussion that um, happens in our case relatively infrequently and that would be what will happen when we go to um, the Postgres version 12 let's say that we choose to go to if it happens to um, make changes not only in software but also in various ways 
to do with persistent data so that things have to be rejigged. Now, under those circumstances, there would be a more complicated um, discussion. So uh, that's perhaps as far as I can go with that. I hope once again that given the whole framework we're in, that was adequate. Don't forget that you can always, if this becomes really um, you know, important for you to know, and I hope it will, that you can join our Slack discussions and um, we do our very best because our survival depends on this to be prompt and um, useful with our answers. And if you ask that kind of question, um, particularly if you frame it very coherently, then you should get a good answer to that there. So is that it, do you think now um, for today? I believe so. So thank you so much for, for joining us, Bren. That was uh, really educational. Oh no, it is I who should thank you for hosting all this and for spiriting up an audience. Of course, of course. Um, so with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Um, Bryn, you have a wonderful rest of yours and um, hopefully we'll see you all again soon.